So if we have a vector valued function and you want to take the limit of it, and the reasons we might want to take the limit are the same reasons that we would take a limit in calc one or calc two. Um, we might be needing a limit to exist, but not necessarily needing the function to have a point at the point we're working at. Um, so we still do involve limits with uh, vector valued functions. It turns out that doing a limit of a vector valued function is really the exact same as doing a limit all the way back in Calc 1, except you really just do it for each component. All right. So each one of these, notice it's just a single variable function, x of t, y of t, z of t. So if you're taking the limit of a vector, vector valued function, you're just doing the limit of each component, which would be the limit of a single variable function. So each of these, doing each of these limits of the components would be exactly, and I mean exactly like doing a limit back in Calc 1, All right? So, You'll, we'll do maybe we'll maybe do one limit today um, on the worksheet, and you'll probably do you'll do a couple in the homework. They're not bad though. Um, and now that we've introduced limits, we can discuss uh, continuity. So a vector-valued function is continuous at a point if the limit at the point is equal to the function at a point. This is our exact same definition of continuity from Calc one. It's just now, it's essentially that we're doing it for three separate functions, one for each component, all right? Um, last thing I'll mention on limits is that in order for the limit of a vector valued function to exist, the limit of all three components must exist. If any one of these limits does not exist, then the overall limit does not exist and the function is not continuous at that point, okay? Um, I just wanted to touch on that before we do get into the calculus because it's something that we start with in, in a Calc 1 course. So basically, for a vector valued function to be continuous, we need all of its components to be continuous. And again, as a reminder, each of its components are just single variable functions. So that's one of the cool things about this 12.2 this, uh, that we're about to go into. The actual calculus you guys are going to be doing is Calc 1 cal level calculus. Because really, you're just doing calculus on single variable functions. When we get into the next module, uh, starting next week, we'll start looking at multivariable functions. We'll talk about calculus on multivariable functions. But for, for what we're doing today, you can go straight off of what you've learned in Calc 1 and Calc 2. It's just now. The way we're writing things is in terms of a vector. All right. So that was, like I said, that was just something I wanted to mention, the limits and continuity. It's not a big uh, issue for us, but we, but we do need to be able to take limits just like we did in Calc 1. Calc 2, or Calc 2, excuse me, 12.2 is where things really, I think, start to get, uh, get interesting. All right, there we go. Because now, finally, guys, you know, we've had a couple, we've been together for a few weeks now. We have really not done any calculus. Everything we've done has been vector-based vector algebra. Um, finally, we're going to start doing some calculus. So now it's going to get fun. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about this. I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, cool examples. And then, like I said, we're gonna spend the rest of the time just working on some problems. Um, but what I want you to keep in mind when I do break you into groups to work on problems, really what you're being asked to do is, is a lot of single variable calculus stuff, but now in this context of vector value functions. And I'll talk about that as we go along. And as always, guys, uh, feel free, you know, as I go along, feel free to ask questions. So if you remember back in Calc 1, you're going to see this is very analogous. We started with position, so maybe you started with a ball being thrown in the air, and you start looking at its velocity and its acceleration. We're going to do the exact same thing here, 
except you already know the relationships. So let's just start off with position. So now instead of just having a position function, what we have is what's called a position vector. All right. And this will give the position of any function uh, at any given time t. So this would be the function for the x coordinate, for the y coordinate, and for the z coordinate. So really, what we have here is a set of parametric equations in three space. So here's a really good example, and this is gonna build on what we talked about last time. So if our, our position function is 10 cosine t, 10 sine t, t, we'll let t go from zero to four pi for this example. Well, what we know from last time is that gives us a cylindrical helix with a radius of 10, because we're going from zero to four pi, and it's just cosine t, y sine t, there's no b there on our trig functions. We know it'll have two windings up the z-axis. And because our z fun function is just t, it's gonna have a height of four pi. So let's bring over the graph. Oops, sorry about that. Let's do this. So here's our graph. So this is that same helix we saw last time. If we were to look directly down the x y, uh, the, down the down the z axis at the x y plane, we would see our uh, circle of radius ten. We know that there's two windings because sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi and our t range is from 0 to 4 pi. So we're going through two periods of sine and cosine. So if you think about the unit circle, that would be two trips around the circle. But because our z is constantly increasing, we get this shape that's a helix. So we go around the circle once is 2 pi, twice is 4 pi. And we, were, we looked at, we played around last time to see how we could adjust that. Now the position would be measured in whatever units our, our function is, these um, components are measured in. So just for this example, let's just say our units are in feet, X and Y and Z are all measured in feet. And um, there's some reasons that I want, that I want to do that just so we think about units. So this could be the path of a particle. So maybe the particle is moving up this helix and its position at any time t is given by this position function. Okay. Now, remind me guys, what's the relationship between position and velocity? Yes. Which one is the yep. Which one is the derivative of which one? Velocity is derivative of position. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Guys, like I said, you're going to see a lot of analogies to Calc one. So if we wanted to find the velocity vector, it's the derivative of our position vector. And as you guys saw in the videos. All you got to do to find it is just calculate the derivative of each component. And again, the derivatives we're going to be doing for these, it's going to be a lot of the derivatives you saw in Calc 1 because they're just single variable functions. So if our R of T is 10 cosine T, 10 sine T, T, then V of T is negative 10 sine T, 10 cosine T and 1, just the derivative of each component. And if we assume T is in seconds, the units on velocity, yes, we'll be working with acceleration too. You're, you guys are going faster than me. <laughs> we'll get to it. Um, and you know, our units would be in feet per second. If we assume that time is in, measured in seconds, if it's in minutes, it'd be feet, feet per minute. So <clears throat> that, that relationship still holds. And once we get to acceleration, we're going to know that relationship too. Now, here's something I want to talk about is speed. Speed and velocity are not the same thing. So we're going to really harp on that a little bit today. V velocity is a vector value quantity, meaning it has a magnitude and a direction. 
Speed only has a magnitude. It does not care about direction. So speed is the magnitude of velocity. So whenever we're looking for the speed, we're just taking the magnitude of our velocity function. And we know that the velocity vector is always tangent to the object's path of motion. So the velocity vector is always going to point in a direction at any given point, we'll point in a direction that is tangent to our motion. And we're going to take a look at that here in a second. But let's talk about the speed for the above helix. So if we were looking at the speed, we know we need to calculate, excuse me, sorry. We know we need to calculate the magnitude of our velocity vector. And guys, this is nothing new. We've done magnitude of a vector before. So we have negative 10 sine t squared plus 10 cosine t squared plus 1 squared. So we have the square root of 100 sine squared t plus 100 cosine squared t plus 1. Now in these first two terms, I can factor out the 100. And once I do that, you might see already why I'm doing that, but it'll be real obvious once we do. 100 sine squared t and then plus cosine squared t plus 1. What is sine squared t plus cosine squared t always, always, always equal to? 1. One. That's our Pythagorean identity, right? So 100 times 1 plus 1 gives us the square root of 101. And then our units are again, are whatever our velocity vector would be in. So, you know, feet per second. Now there's something, there's a reason I'm doing this and there's something very important I want to point out because this won't always happen. Sorry, that got a little messy. Okay. <clears throat> um, notice there is no T left in the speed. That, you know, that's not always going to happen. It is um, right here. Um, because it's dot product, because V is a, is a vector. So this is, this dot here represents dot product. So, it's really, this is really important that there's no T. So note, no T. Why is that important? That means our speed is constant. Not necessarily, mean, that doesn't mean our velocity is constant. In fact, look at our velocity vector. As, as we change T, our velocity vector will change. So that's so our speed is constant, our velocity vector is not. That's something I really want to stress is the difference between those two. Uh, speed would be variable anytime you take the magnitude and there's still a variable in there. If there's no variable, it's constant. So that's going to be um, a really important factor and I'll show you why. This is pretty cool. This is one of the, the uh, 
Yeah, speed is a speed is a scalar because it's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Velocity is a vector value uh, quantity, therefore it's a, a vector. All right, so we, we, we talked about our helix here. I'm going to add the velocity vector to it. We'll add the acceleration later. All right, so here's our point, and we got our trace vector. Now let's turn off the trace vector. That black vector is our, I don't want to, I don't want to get confused between two. That black vector is our velocity vector. Now remember what we said. The vector is, the velocity vector is not constant. The speed is. And also the velocity vector stays tangent to the direction of motion. So let me try and get this at an angle where you can see it. Okay, watch what happens as we move along our helix. See how it stays tangent to the direction of motion. Notice what, what does not change. The vector always stays the same length. It's kind of hard to tell because of the angle, so I'll change that here in a second. But we can see how it's tangent. Now if I go straight down, or as straight down as I can get, let's get fairly straight down. Watch when I move it around now. See how the length of the vector, no matter where it is, is always the same? That's because it has a constant magnitude. So what's changing about the velocity is not its magnitude, but its direction, okay? That means we have a changing velocity. There is something keeping it on this helix, despite having a constant speed. So, pause there. Uh, questions so far? All right, let's talk a little bit about direction. So, we have our position vector, then our direction, which again is tangent to our, our position, is given by the unit vector in the direction of the velocity. So that's all this is, guys. This is nothing new. This is just our unit vector. This is sometimes known as the unit tangent vector. All it is is the unit is the unit vector in the direction of the velocity vector. That would give us our direction, like we've talked about before, a unit vector preserves, uh, preserves, excuse me, direction, but eliminates magnitude. Lastly is our acceleration vector. We, uh, this was asked about before. Um, you know, we know that the acceleration is the derivative of position. I'm sorry. <laughs> The acceleration is the derivative of velocity, which is the derivative of position. So guys, this is something that you guys will be able to find real quickly. If you have a position vector, its first derivative is velocity, its second derivative is acceleration, and we just write them up in component form. So here's our acceleration vector for our problem. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it, but if we did take the magnitude of our acceleration vector, we would find that it's still constant. So what I want to do is add our acceleration vector to our drawing here. Now remember, we said that the magnitude of velocity was constant, but the vector was changing. There's something keeping it on the helix. Well, a change in velocity by definition is acceleration. Well, check out you know, it's kind of hard to see at this angle, but check out that green arrow right there. That's our acceleration vector pointing inwards. That's what's keeping the velocity vector on the helix. Notice it always points inward because it's basically, I like thinking of it as what's turning the velocity vector. Let me go straight down again so you can see that the magnitude doesn't change. I don't know if we'll get a really good angle at this, but I'll see what I can do. Now you can kind of see the green arrow there, and there's our black vector arrow. 
So as we go around, notice the green arrow stays the same, but it's the green arrow that's keeping us on there. The magnitude, yeah, the magnitude is, uh, the magnitude of that acceleration vector is equal to the radius of the helix. Yep, it is, Cooper. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah, for those of you guys who had physics, that's our centripetal uh, force there, keeping us on the circular motion. All right. So what I want, some, here's what I want you to take from this. Number one, basically our Calc 1 ideas are still holding, right? Velocity is the derivative of position. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. And the unit tangent vector is a unit vector in the direction of the velocity vector. Uh, the, the graph is here because I just wanted to get a visual of what's going on. You can, because I think, I feel like we can actually see the acceleration vector changing the velocity vector because it's keeping it on the helix. All right. And guys, you can play around with this. You know, if you did, if you, uh, the question came up earlier, like uh, to not have a uniform uh, speed. Now this is going to get a little messy. So bear with me. If you change these, so you don't have, so we no longer have a uniform uh, speed. <laughs> it gets a little messy. Uh, let me see if, I don't know if this is gonna be able to handle it. Oh, there we go. Now watch what happens as I go around. So let's start over here at the beginning. See how the acceleration and the velocity are pointing in the same direction? So as I move around, notice the vector getting larger. That's what you would see if you don't have uniform speed, I know, right? Uh, because of the functions I'm using, this thing is doing so many windings from zero to four pi. Um, that's why it's a little convoluted there. But I just wanted you to see what happens when you don't have constant, a constant speed. Not only will the direction of your velocity vector change, your magnitude will as well. So you can kind of see it getting larger there. I know it's hard to, hard to see just because it's not the prettiest uh, graph with these settings. So that's how you would know you, that you don't, you, that's how graphically you would see that you don't have a, a constant speed. You'd know mathematically, because when you take the magnitude of the velocity vector, you'd have a T left in there. Okay. Two last things that I want to talk about real quick, and then, uh, then we're going to go do some, do some work. One is, and one's not a big, this isn't a big deal. It's not going to come up a whole lot. But because we, whoops, sorry, I went back too far. Because we, you know, have talked about dot product and cross product, if you're doing the derivative of a dot product, this is the formula for the derivative of a dot product. Okay. Again, guys, I've you know, I know I say this a lot, but you don't have to memorize these. You know, put them on, it's something that can go on your note card. You're not gonna see it come up a lot. I just wanted to touch on them. Um, it looks a lot like our product rule from Calc 1, right? Leave one alone, dot with the derivative of the other, plus the derivative of the other, dotted with the other one left alone. Same thing with if you're doing the derivative of a cross product. All right, so it's basically an application of our product rule along with the dot and cross product. That's all. Um, not a big deal, it's, it's more, this is more computational stuff. You guys have the formulas, they're, they're pretty easy to use. You've had practice with dot product, you've had practice with cross product, and you've had practice with derivatives in your previous calc classes. All right, last thing, we're gonna skip that for right now. We might come back to it if we have time later, but it's not crucial because we talked about it in terms of our helix here. We can do antiderivatives of vector valued functions. Just like with the derivatives, you just do the derivative of each piece. So it's, again, it's basically like doing three Calc 1 problems. If they're indefinite integrals, in other words, if there's no limits, 
um, we have, we just add on what we call a C vector. So we would just put the plus C, we could just put the plus C here at the end. We don't have to put a plus C on each one. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just vector addition. So that C vector would be made up of a C1, a C2, and a C3, a constant for each vector, all right? So again, it's basically three Calc 1 problems. Oops. Now, we also can do, if we, oh, sorry, yeah. If we're given an initial condition, we can solve for those constants. All right, so that would be an initial value problem. So if it says, you know, fine, if it gives you the velocity vector, uh, it depends on the context. If you find the antiderivative of a velocity vector, you're getting the position vector. If you're finding the antiderivative of an acceleration vector, it gives you a velocity vector. The, uh, the antiderivatives of vector value functions give you the exact same things they gave you in Calc 1. So it's all context-based. Lastly, definite integrals. Same thing. Now, now we have limits. So you would just do the fundamental theorem of calculus on each component. And so our final answer, if you have definite integrals, would be a vector with constants for components. So mathematically, we're doing Calc 1 stuff just in the form of a vector. Uh, and going to, and, and just kind of reiterating uh, what Ryan. Okay, so the question came up, can you do the definite integrals on the calculator? Yes, but if you have a situation where an exact answer is required, and you know, the, the calculator might not give it in terms of like pi or e. Uh, so just look out if you have to, if, it, if you're asked for an exact answer, um, you might want to calculate it by hand, but if not, yeah, you can do it. You can do definite intervals with the calculator. Absolutely. No problem. Um, and like, uh, and going back to uh, Ryan's question of, you know, what are these antiderivatives, the and in definite integrals give us, they essentially give us the same thing <clears throat> they gave us in Calc 1. So one of the, oh, and Calc 2. If you remember in Calc 2, you did a whole section on, um, on applications of integrals, right? Work problems, uh, arc length, things of that nature. It's get, they're, you're gonna be getting the same thing. So if we have a vector value position function, we could do the arc length by doing um, definite integrals on each component. So it's all context-based as far as what the antiderivatives and definite integrals give you. What I want to really stress is computationally, we're really doing uh, uh, Calc 1 problems. We're just doing them once for each component. OK. Questions at this point? Um, yeah, it, so the question came up about definite intervals on a calculator. Uh, I have a video on YouTube about that. So what I'll do is while you guys are working in groups, I'll get the uh, link to that and throw it in chat. No problem. Okay. So Here's what I want to do. I'm going to break you into groups. I'm going to put the, I'm putting the uh, worksheets <clears throat> in chat now. So all groups are going to do the, I want you to start with the 12.2 worksheet. So all groups, I want to do the 12.2 worksheet. There's um, three questions on it. Go ahead. I want you in your groups to work on all three. Oh, shoot. Sorry, those didn't go to everyone. Here, let me do that again. There's the 12.1 worksheet and the 12.2. Okay, so in your groups, first thing I want you to do is the 12.2 worksheet because there's three good questions in there that I think will get you thinking about what we just talked about and what you learned in the video lessons. Um, 
those are going to be the ones you post in the forum. If your group finishes those three problems early, I want you to move on to the 12 one worksheet. So let me bring over the, the worksheets so you can see them actually while I'm talking about them. So here's, here's 12 one. And here, I'm sorry, 12 two. And here's 12 one. Ah, stop. <laughs> All right, so here's what I would like you guys to do. So um, you're gonna do the 12-2 worksheet, all three questions. Uh, most of the stuff we just talked about, two is gonna get you thinking a little bit about finding a tangent vector and tangent line, because that's gonna use some of the stuff we talked about um, last class. But uh, so you're gonna start with the 12-2 worksheet. If you guys finish that early, then I want you to move on to 12-1 worksheet, and I want you to try number four first, doing the limit. See if you can evaluate that limit. Then if you finish that early, you can try some of these problems. This will give you a chance to play around with calc, uh, the CalcPlot 3D. You know, see how changing the parameters changes your graphs, all right? So those are both in chat. And I'm gonna break you guys into groups. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, I want to bring you back a couple minutes early. Um, you know, I got to meet with a few groups and um, I think we got the idea on number two. I just wanted to mention a couple things about number two and a couple things about number three. Um, so for number two, you know, one of the things in the, the groups that I met with that we talked about is when you're finding this, this tangent vector, what we're doing is we're taking our position at time one as a vector and we're adding, because that, that tells us what our location is at time one. That's our location on the curve. So then we're adding to it the direction we're going and that's given by any vector. Sorry, I know these are starting to look similar. That's an R. any vector that is parallel to our velocity vector at time one, and that gets multiplied by our variable, okay? So this is, so just like a tangent line in, in 2D or back in Calc 1, we needed a point of tangency, that tells us where, it's, where it is on our curve, and then we need a direction. That was in Calc 1, that was the slope, or the derivative, at our point, we're doing the same thing. This is our function at time one, plus our derivative at time one, multiplied by our variable. So I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate that with the tangent line. Okay, I wanna mention one thing about number three, because I know some of you guys didn't get to try it. So number three, notice we're given the velocity and asked to find the position. That's telling us that we want the antiderivative of our velocity. Sorry. We want the antiderivative of our velocity at t. So what does that mean? We're going to take the uh, antiderivative of each piece. All right. So I'm not even going to erase that. So, a of t, why am I writing A of t? Even I get stuck between derivatives and antiderivatives sometimes. It happens to all of us. So R of t, I want to just show you one thing, is going to be, we do the antiderivative of each of these. So we have 2t cubed sine of t. And, whoops, that's not 12. It's gonna be four e to the t plus that constant vector that we were talking about. 
all right? So one of the things that we're, we, should, we need to start getting used to is thinking in terms of vectors. And it's one of the things I kind of noticed as I was talking to some of the groups is I think it's, it, we're still working on that piece. This would be the same as if I did this. 2t cubed plus c1 sine of t plus c2 4 e to the t plus c3. It's just vector addi addition where we add the like components. All right. Now, the reason we're, we need those C's though, check this out, we have an initial value problem. This tells us when this thing is a zero, it should equal one, negative five, two. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means when I put in zero for T, so I get two times zero cubed plus C1, sine of zero plus C2, and for e to the zero plus c3, it should be equal to one negative five two. Guys, these are three separate equations. So this first equation equals one, the second equation equals negative five, third equation equals my messy little two here. So really I'm just doing three separate calc one problems we're just writing them in terms of a vector. This gives us that, you know, C1 equals one, C2 equals negative five, and be careful because E to the zero is one. So this is four plus C3 equals two. So C3 equals negative two. And so there's a couple different ways we can write this. One is we can write them all in the same vector. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right, so our 2t cubed plus one, sine of t minus five, and 4e to the t minus two. Or, and there's nothing wrong with this either. We can say, okay, this is 2t cubed, sine of t, 4e to the t, plus the vector of our constants. One, negative five, negative two. All right, so one of them is our containing, is the one containing our variables, kind of like up here, and the other one's containing our constants, kind of like up here. All right. Um, so I wanted to go through that. I want, I want to get us to really start thinking of these things in terms of vectors. But I also want you to realize the vectors are more of an organizational tool, right? This is our x of t here. You know, this is our x of t. This is our y of t. This is our z of t. Not, it's not a t, is it? This is our z of t. So what the vector is doing really is it's just organizing our parametric equations in three space, all right? So, so I want you to get used to seeing the vectors, but I don't want you to get um, frustrated when you see the vectors, because all it is doing is organizing our parametric equations for us. Questions about, about that uh, specifically, number three here, or this idea of organizing in, a, in vector notation. Because vector value functions are new for us guys. We just started them this week. I do not expect you guys to be experts on these yet. Um, we looked at the plots a little bit on Tuesday, and now today we're actually starting to do calculus with them. Um, next week, we'll, uh, on Tuesday, we'll look at uh, arc length and curvature of vector valued functions. And then we'll, we'll use vector value functions every once in a while because it's a great way of organizing our parametric equations. They'll come up again when we get into parameterized surfaces, um, but that's not till later this semester. Okay, I see that it's 631. So um, for the forum, you know, we only did 12.2 today. 
So 12.2 is going to be the one that you submit. Um, if you want to try some of the problems on 12.1 over the weekend, you know, those graph, because there's some good uh, graphing ones on there. I'll bring over the uh, worksheet real quick. If you want to try one, two, and three, practice with those. And if you post them, you know, I'll give you credit for them, but they're not going to be the, the ones I'm, you know, quote unquote, requiring you to post for participation points. Those are going to be 12.2 because that's what we worked on in class. 12.1 is just a little bit of extra practice. Um, one thing I want to mention, because I know, I know we're already over time and some people are leaving. I got a couple questions about the take home problems. Guys, the take home problems are part of your midterm. So they are not due until the midterm. You can absolutely turn those in early if you finish them early, that's totally fine. The due date for them is on the more calendar. Um, and the submission guidelines, the way you're supposed to submit them are in a folder called midterm take home problems. That's in the course content folder. It'll, it'll give you the, four, the, the, the guidelines um, and making sure you include your work on that stuff, okay? So make sure you take a look at that. You can submit them module by module. So if you finish the module one take home problems and you wanna submit them, that's totally fine. If you wanna uh, do them all together and submit them as a single PDF, that's fine as well. It's, that, that's completely up to you. I'm fine with either. Um, again, the biggest thing, the biggest things to uh, remember about the take home problems, make sure you justify your answer. Uh, you can use whatever you want to solve the problem. If you use Wolfram Alpha to do the whole thing, totally fine. Just make sure you use screenshots of the Wolfram Alpha work. That will count as your work. Okay. If you give me just an answer, um, and it's, if it's correct, you'll get partial credit. But if you give me just an answer and it's incorrect, I can't give you any credit. If I see your work and I see that you entered something wrong into Wolfram Alpha, at least I can give you partial credit because you would have had it right had you not put the negative instead of the positive or something. So it's actually to your advantage to, to, to always submit your work, all right? All right, guys, I know we're already a few minutes over. Um, if you have questions, let me know. But uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to make sure I talked about the take home problems. As always, guys, you can email me. Don't forget, you have access to online tutoring, both through the Math Center and BrainFuse. They're available over the weekend. So take advantage of those as needed. The forum, you can always use anytime. It's great for us to share knowledge there because if you have a question, very, very good chance at least one of the person in the class has the same question. All right. All right. If you guys don't have any questions, good job today. Remember to post your uh, work from 12.2. Um, you can earn up to three points, one for one, because there were three problems. And it's fine if you want to do number three and post it because, yeah, I did it, but you redoing it will help you remember it better. And I'm totally fine with that. All right. If you guys have any questions over the weekend, feel free to shoot me an email. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll post the video from tonight. Sorry, I just cut somebody off. What was? Oh, I was just saying thanks. Okay, you're welcome, Daniel. Sorry about that. <laughs> and yeah, I was a little late posting the, the video from Thursday and last Tuesday. Those are now posted. Sorry about that. If I ever forget to post a video, just remind me. Uh, I, you know, I have to wait for it to upload after class and sometimes I forget to post it. So if you're ever looking for it and it's not up there, just shoot me an email. Chances are I just forgot to get the link in there to you. Have a nice night. You too. Thanks, Garrett. Thanks, Professor. You got it, Andre. Have a good night.